you know, one thing that, you know, I think I already mentioned, and I just shared the reports in this chat for those who are new, um, you know, um, this is now um, the, oh my God, I think the sixth or seventh salon that we're now doing on a weekly basis, uh, where we're taking kind of like a little bit of a look uh, again for the long term uh, on like what technologies are going to be important uh, on the very, very long term. And, you know, of course that starts uh, with, uh, with science and uh, science, I think, and as this kind of like, um, as the, as the title really beautifully illustrates, right? Um, there is a lot of uh, inspiration in biology for design and engineering, right? And I think one thing uh, that kind of drove that home to me, um, so Fawcett has been doing technical competitions um, on uh, a yearly basis, uh, sometimes two a year, that focus on bringing two different technological or scientific areas together to try to solve a problem in one uh, by using another one. And uh, we had uh, Michael Lech, he was on this call. He was joining um, the technical competition of two years ago, uh, which was uh, on molecular machines. Um, and we kind of like took a really, really broad approach on okay, how can we actually push uh, the envelope and what is possible in the design um, of molecular machines. And we had Fraser Stoddard um, who co-chaired uh, that event and he actually uh, got, the, um, got awarded um, uh, in a group, uh, the Nobel Prize for his work um, on molecular machines uh, just uh, a few years earlier than that. So it was a really, really fantastical technical competition. Um, and many, many of the talks actually at that competition uh, directly credited um, uh, credited nature <laughs> and, the, and the way that, uh, that nature is doing its magic uh, as kind of like a main uh, source for the way that they get their inspirations in uh, the designs that uh, that they come up with. And then uh, now again, it kind of, um, th that point was made even clearer to me because I just finished the second uh, report of the second iteration of the competition, which was in 2019. And I just shared that report uh, in the group chat. So that's fresh of the bed. It is not even available online yet. Um, I, we, we literally just finished it last week, but I thought I would share it with people here because it may be quite interesting to inform our discussion later um, when we talk a little bit about, okay, what are specific um, areas in which we can take uh, uh, um, inspiration uh, from nature. And uh, yeah, I think one thing that becomes really quite clear when you read the report is that, you know, many of the kind of like talks that I hope to sum summarize in it, we have like molecular machines operating in solutions, molecular machines operating in the solid state, DNA nanomachines for discovery biology, responsive nanostructures and catalytic nanoreactors, probing individual molecular machines using single molecule techniques. Um, slide wing materials and their applications. So there's a lot of like really, 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 I think cutting edge science in there. And um, Fraser Stoddard has done a fantastic job at corralling a lot of um, really from the world's uh, most experts, people in person <laughs> um, uh, to, to this meeting. And I think even looking at all of their presentation videos, which I'm actually gonna share a quicker link to that, uh, if you wanna uh, take a look, has I think really drives home the point that all of them, like not like most of them, wouldn't have been possible if uh, those people haven't uh, wouldn't have taken some inspiration from biology in the first place. And um, I think the way that they that it comes up in every one of those conversations and every one of those presentations is really um, kind of like made that topic very very um, kind of like visceral in my head. And then um, having talked to uh, Michael and Tom who suggested this topic, I was just like, okay, this is a perfect match. Uh, kind of like the two fit really, really nicely together. So I'm hoping that we can um, find some kind of practical angles in the discussion afterwards. For now, I don't want to take uh, away from our fantastic uh, speakers and I'm hoping that we can launch into the discussion uh, afterwards. I think we're going to have a short intro presentation by Tom, then by Michael, uh, and then I'm hoping that, you know, we can really make this as fluid as possible. Um, I think, you know, a few um, words to introduce uh, Tom before, you know, I'll, I'll give the, 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 the floor to you as uh, Tom Schröder was an undergrad and uh, where he studied organic chemistry at North Northwestern University. So I think uh, many of the people in that report will be familiar to you. Uh, he did, has a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Michigan uh, on bio-inspired membranes uh, that are directly taking inspiration from plants, extremophiles, and the electric eel. And I'll share uh, a paper on that here in the chat. Uh, then he worked on the Adolf, uh, in the, at the Adolf Merkel Institute in Freiburg in Switzerland, um, which is the headquarters of the National Center for Competency in Research for Bio-inspired Materials. Um, and he's currently a postdoc in Joanna Eisenberg's Biominimalization and Biomimetics Group at Harvard working on neuron-inspired soft ionic electronics. 
And I think two um, you know, presentations that I'm going to share here in the chat was uh, two recent research uh, kind of efforts on his end are uh, directly an electric eel inspired soft power structure from stacked hydrogels. So I'll share that a link to that. And then uh, the really, really, uh, I think, um, catchy title, it's not a bug, it's a feature, functional materials and insects. So I'm going to share uh, both of the, uh, both of the, um, the, uh, the, both of the research links here in the chat. But for now, I'm really, really happy that you, that you are able to join us. And I, I can't wait for the presentation. After you, we have Michael, and then we open up for discussion with the questions that you provided. But please take it away. I'm really, really, really happy and glad you joined. Thank you so much, Allison. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so at the beginning of this discussion, I think what I'm going to try to do is make explicit uh, sort of the case for bioinspiration. I, I um, in sort of inferring that uh, many of you are probably familiar with the concept, at least uh, at the beginning, but really the um, sort of the case for why uh, looking to nature to solve problems that we have is a good idea stems from the idea that, well, uh, life on Earth began billions of years ago, um, and in the intervening time has spread throughout the Earth to all sorts of, basically every habitat imaginable. Uh, we have organisms that um, live at the bottom of the ocean near hydrothermal vents. We have organisms that uh, fly through the air, plants that disperse their seeds on the wind. Uh, we have organisms living um, in Antarctica under ice. We have organisms living at the tops of mountains. Uh, we have uh, organisms that live in the desert. We have single-celled organisms. Um, we have uh, animals as large as the blue whale. Basically, there is a huge diversity of um, geographical range of temperature conditions, humidity conditions, uh, length scales, um, all occupied by organisms in nature. And um, uh, in order for life to proliferate in this way, um, many adaptations had to evolve, very specific adaptations to the specific boundary conditions that are experienced by each organism. In order to live long enough to reproduce, um, living things had, had to be able to uh, complete very specific tasks. In the abstract, these are pretty simple. Uh, you need to be able to find food, eat, um, metabolize, or photosynthesize. Um, live long enough to reproduce, uh, which might mean not being eaten, which might mean not succumbing to the elements, etc. Um, and then, in fact, to reproduce. Um, and uh, in the case of sexually reproducing organisms, this means finding a mate, which means often communication, um, etc. And so the tasks involved in those sort of abstract umbrellas are often very specific things, uh, things like adhesion. Say you're an insect that needs to adhere to uh, a rock in a stream in order to uh, sort of find a purchase and, and live your life. Um, you need an adhesive that works underwater for this. Uh, I already mentioned communication functions, um, things that allow uh, animals to find each other or uh, for potential prey animals to uh, communicate to predators that they have poison uh, within them so that they are not eaten. Um, uh, these very chemical defense mechanisms are another example of specific adaptations. Um, so basically, uh, in biology, we have three things working in concert to produce uh, these adaptations. Um, so the selective pressures associated with each environment are one. Um, this basically is any way in which um, anything fighting against the survival of, of the organism or species. Um, we have uh, random mutation as sort of a generative uh, driving force for solutions to the problems. And then simply the many generations, the, uh, the survival or not, uh, or not of the organisms that have been living um, since the beginning of life. Um, these are kind of the things that have given rise to very specific solutions. So bioinspiration um, really is the idea that we have problems that we are looking to solve and that in order to solve these problems, it is a good idea to uh, look at how evolution solved related problems in nature. So I'm gonna give you a few uh, sort of examples of uh, ascending abstraction here of bioinspiration. Um, so the first, uh, comes from a fish. Um, so there is a fish uh, that lives in the Northern Atlantic off the coast of New England. I live in Massachusetts, so pretty near me. Um, and uh, it's called the ocean pout. The ocean pout expresses an antifreeze protein. Um, and this, is, this allows it to live uh, in freezing or near freezing temperatures without literally freezing solid. 
Um, and these antifreeze proteins bind to the surface of ice crystals in order to, uh, to prevent the ice crystals from forming in places where they don't, um, uh, you know, where it would be deleterious to the survival of the animal to, to, for ice to be forming. Um, so a human concern that shares this uh, uh, sort of concern about ice crystals um, is Unilever. So Unilever is a large consumer products company um, that uh, makes, among many other things, uh, Magnum, Breyers, and Cornetto brand ice creams. Um, and so under these brands, Unilever was formulating low-fat ice creams, uh, but they kept have the pro having the problem of ice crystals forming, which kind of disrupted the creamy texture of the low-fat ice cream formulations. Um, so uh, basically, they did years of research on this and took the protein from fish, these antifreeze proteins, um, expressed them, uh, and uh, have been using them since 2010 in their low-fat ice cream formulations to improve the texture. So that's an example where basically uh, the company directly took a material from uh, a living organism, put it in their material, in this case, ice cream, um, and uh, in that way, sort of improved their product. Um, so my own work is sort of a more abstract example of bioinspiration. So I, um, as Allison mentioned, did my PhD. Um, uh, one of the big projects I did during my PhD was um, uh, developing a power source, an electrical power source that is based on the uh, electric eel. So electric eels are capable of uh, generating these very large electrical discharges um, using these specialized electric organs that occupy the back 80% of their body length. Um, so essentially, this is inherently to us an interesting thing, right? The ability to generate electrical power uh, that's usable within the constraints of biology um, and without any sort of fancy um, electrochemistry or anything like that. And so um, basically, uh, there's been a lot of biology, um, a lot of work characterizing electric eels and their electric organs. Um, and uh, we took a look at this work and sort of recognized that for all intents and purposes, when an electric eel is discharging, um, it, these organs serve as uh, a stack of membranes of alternating selectivity that separate uh, compartments, aqueous compartments of alternating um, ion composition. Uh, and basically when you have a selective membrane in the presence of an ion gradient, um, a, an electrical potential arises across that membrane. And in the, um, when, when issuing a discharge, uh, this basically in an electric eel looks like a stack of batteries. Um, and so in that way, they're able to generate hundreds of volts. Um, so we were able to generate a structure with using that kind of same motif of alternating selectivity membranes and alternating ionic strength compartments uh, in order to um, make a, an aqueous gel-based scheme that did the same thing. It was able to generate over 100 volts using basically just salts and um, aqueous solutions and selective membranes. Um, so that's an example of uh, how we sort of used a scheme uh, from biology um, and then implemented it in our own way. Uh, so then a significantly more abstract uh, example of bioinspiration um, is a computing algorithm called ant colony optimization. Um, so ant colony optimization, the original paper was from the 90s and I think it has something like 20,000 citations. Um, and effectively, uh, this is a way of optimizing different conditions that is based on the way that ant colonies find food and communicate this between their individual units in order to coordinate the acquisition of nutrients for, for the colony. Uh, they do this using pheromone trails. Basically, they um, leave uh, trails of pheromones to indicate where they've been and how, uh, and you know, whether to send their um, sort of colony mates in the same direction when going out foraging. And um, this type of scheme, sort of dividing your computing power into artificial subunits um, that then are able to sort of produce. Uh, weighted responses to, um, to inputs from an environment turns out to be quite useful for solving certain types of problems that are called NP hard problems um, in computing, uh, which basically, uh, these are problems where finding an exact best solution would take a very long time. Um, so the, the time required to uh, calculate a, the, the uh, best solution, be sure that you've 
obtained it, uh, is exponential with the com complexity of the problem. Uh, and these problems in contemporary life tend to be routing problems. Uh, and they manifest in things like telecommunications and in supply chains. Um, so ant colony optimization and actual ant colonies for that matter, um, are very good at generating high quality solutions that might not necessarily be the best solution, but are at least acceptably good um, within a short amount of time. Uh, and so, yeah, this is, this is something that's used contemporarily in, in telecoms. Um, so uh, at this point, basically, you might be asking yourself, okay, how, how can I be inspired by biology uh, in my day to day life? Um, so my, I guess, recommendations for this uh, are reading biology literature. Um, so in particular, the Journal of Experimental Biology is a particular favorite of mine. They, um, this is a place where uh, biologists and, and other researchers will um, literally, you know, subject um, biological systems, organisms, et cetera, to a range of, uh, of um, conditions uh, and basically see how they work, see, test the ways in which the solutions that they've evolved different uh, problems uh, are, you know, the ways in which they evolve, the ways in which they're effective, etc. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind that it is the labor of biologists, people who have taken the time to characterize and find um, the sort of vast diversity of adaptations in biology that makes being inspired by biology possible uh, for researchers like me and maybe you. Um, this is also another reason, uh, although not the main reason, but just a reason why um, contemporary biodiversity loss is a sort of tragic phenomenon. Um, basically, the uh, you know if we if we lose kind of this natural heritage before we have a chance to really um, kind of see what's going on and and. Uh, become inspired by it, uh, that, that is a large loss to uh, the efforts of engineers and technologists. Um, so uh, that is my piece, I think, of this uh, introduction. And I think I'll pass things along to, to Michael. Um, so Allison, if you want to introduce him, that would be great. Yes. Thank you so, so much. Can you please check, because I was trying to find the uncolony link. Can you check if it's the right one that I posted in the chat? Um, oh, sure. Because there I think it's, it's like there's a lot of research on this now. They're probably right. all the right with one paper, but there's a lot of like really quite actionable research. I just did a quick Google search and uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Thank you so, so much. I also posted the, um, uh, at least the, the, the paper on eels that you discussed um, here in the chat. So I'm hoping that people can maybe take a look and, 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 and that can inform our uh, discussion afterwards. Uh, for now, I'm super, super happy uh, to be joined by Michael Leach. Is that the correct uh, pronunciation, actually? Yeah, right. Okay, I'm yes. German too. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, Michael is not only um, a 2019 Foresight Fellow, which we're really, really, really honored to, um, to, to count you in, in, amongst our alumni, but uh, you're orig originally Swiss. Uh, studied at the uh, ETH Zurich Interdisciplinary science, Sciences, focusing on cellular biology and organic synthesis. Uh, you did uh, your PhD in the Netherlands, uh, to be more specific, at the University of Groningen, uh, in the group of Ben Feringa, who many people here probably know from the Feringa motor, I'm guessing. Um, and uh, you um, focused on photo photopharmacology and the use of light for the control of biological systems. So perhaps we can get into that as well during the discussion. Sure. Um, and you're currently a postdoc in the group of Jana Eisenberg as well at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the Wiss Institute uh, for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. And you're working on autonomous and self-regulated microstructured materials. Uh, and I thought super interesting and that probably inspired a few of the kind of uh, questions that um, you um, proposed for our discussion. You organized and hosted salons in Switzerland um, and the Netherlands and the US, um, uh, especially on, uh, for example, at this Switzerland Philosophy Salon Festival. Uh, and the topic there was frontiers in nature and technology. So me wearing my philosophy hat, I would be super, super keen to get into that in the discussion. Um, you also have a really fantastic publication out that is a viewpoint homeostasis as an inspiration toward interactive materials. Um, and I'm going to share a link to that in the chat and a link to your bio too. And for now, I'm really, really happy to have you here. Please take it away. Thanks so much, Alison. Uh, well, 
Welcome everyone. I'm super excited to, to be here today and, and to share our passion for buying inspiration. And, and I'm aware that probably many of you are already quite familiar with the topic. And so it's really not the, the idea of educating you here, but more of having like a discussion and, and to share this passion and, and to kind of think about maybe long term a vision and also fundamental questions that are behind bio inspiration. Uh, in addition to what Tom, uh, Tom, thank you, Tom, for for this fantastic introduction and for the examples. Uh, I would like to take a, a slight turn on the, on that perspective and provide another perspective that is particularly important in the chemical sciences, namely instead of looking into the different biological niches and try to see what kind of specializations we can use for engineering applications, um, it also uh, is worth actually looking at very general principles that every, almost every organism and every cell in nature adheres to. And a few fundamental, like two fundamental uh, principles that I would like to point out here are first of all, homeostasis, so the ability of an organism to regulate its internal physiological conditions uh, by means of uh, feedback, but also by means of actually sensing what is going out on outside. And the second one is actually to be able with perhaps the same type of stimulus to give very different type of responses depending on the context. So give, having this diversity of functions and responses in almost an interactive way. And when we design materials as scientists or as engineers, we have the same problem as animals have. Materials have to be robust, materials have to survive in a changing environment. And so understanding the boundary conditions that nature operates in and then see what kind of solutions on the most fundamental level cells have come up with can be very fruitful in order to create a new type of materials that are to be considered smart and that are possibly of the next generation. This indeed actually is a, a hot topic at the moment or already since 15 to 10 to 15 years, namely this, this concept of smart materials where you take chemistry and you take the interaction between different molecules and interface that at different levels of complexity in order to get responsiveness, adaptation and homeostasis, homeostasis and self-regulation in functional materials. Uh, applications are obvious. Think about sustainable housing, right, where you have uh, materials that uh, could respond to irradiation from the sun, so they could like filter out certain types of irradiation, uh, materials that respond to humidity or to heat or even could detect some toxic compounds from the outside and then switch on a catalyst that destroys these toxic compounds and, and cleans the air and purifies the air. And if we look at, in order to get inspiration for this type of, of behaviors and this type of complexity, uh, the fundamental challenge we face really is at the, and I'm a chemist, I'm, I'm a synthetic chemist by training, is to understand and be able to make molecules, combine these molecules into more complex systems, and then make these complex systems do stuff. And there's a myriad of challenges that you face when you try to do this. Uh, just giving a few examples. Uh, first of all, if you, have, if you have different type of molecules interacting with each other, you have to make sure that your function only happens where you need it and doesn't happen everywhere else. So you have to be able to take reactions, confine them to a certain time, to a certain place. Uh, you have to think about how do you separate functions? How do you make specialized functions within uh, within a chemical system. How do you control these functions, right? How do you, for example, get complex phenomena just as uh, oscillations, right? What we see in nature with circadian rhythms. How do you create materials that have a circadian rhythm and how would you uh, make use of this uh, in a functional way for, for something useful in our everyday life? And uh, something that is very close to my heart, just as a side note, is this idea of asymmetry in materials. So like if you look at the developing embryo and, 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 and if you look at uh, organisms in general, they all have a body plan where they have a main directionality. How do you actually create in a purely chemical system uh, a directionality and an artificial body plan? 
And these are all, all very, very fundamental questions in which cells, just any type of cell, is a wonderful playground to, to go and explore and try to understand uh, and come up with good, uh, or like at least be inspired by, by good solutions. I would like to take uh, a few examples uh, to this discussion. The obvious one is just because of my background as a, as a, uh, a synthetic chemist and my PhD in, in the group of Ben Feringa, namely the idea of molecular motors. Right? In cells, molecular motors such as dinins, kinesins, or even ATP, ATP synthase, they're absolutely fundamental to the workings of a cell. They're also very important to establish directionality and to transport stuff. And uh, so it has not been surprising that people actually have come up with methods to make uh, synthetic motors. And if you haven't already done so, definitely take a look at the report that Alison shared uh, and see what is currently going on. Uh, just one mention to, or kind of one shout out to what we actually kind of try to do with molecular machines is really this concept or the big change when you go from a macroscopy scale where you can rely on it for uh, inertia and on like rigid materials where you can, for example, just build a, a normal mechanical machine. Uh, and then going down to the molecular scale where you have actually inherently flexible molecules and you can't rely on your inertia anymore, but you actually have to fight constant viscous forces. Flexo. And there's a lot of browning motion going on. And so there's a quite completely different set of conditions that you have to deal with that you have to take into account when you design such molecular machines and molecular molecules. And there is no way to find out or like to learn about how to create a nanomotor uh, from, a, from a steam train like from a steam, steam machine. You, ha you would rather have a look at actually what is done in nature and try to understand then how you can build one yourself. Another very important topic at the moment in chemistry, and some of you might be familiar with the idea, is out of equilibrium chemical systems. If you look at the fundamental principle of life, it is that it's out of equilibrium, out of thermal uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, if you look, for example, into Irving Schrödinger's book, What is Life? from the 1940s, he explicitly mentions that the idea that in order to survive, any organism has to take up fuel, he has to, has to process that fuel by a metabolism and use that energy uh, in uh, use that energy to do certain functions. And in chemistry and also in material science, most of the systems that we use are working at uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. And it's very difficult to actually come up with uh, systems that work out of thermodynamic equilibrium and that in this way kind of mimic these lifelike functions. Most recently, uh, last maybe one or two years, there's this idea of uh, Pavlovian uh, materials, a very cool name, where uh, people are trying to teach material stuff. So basically incorporate uh, chemical mechanisms in a material that then allows the material to learn by combining different stimuli in a certain order and to then trigger certain pre-trained responses. And the last, and I think, possibly most fundamental part is this idea of self-assembly, controlled self-assembly. If you look at a cell, uh, we have a myriad of different components. How do you make sure that all these components end up at the right place? Mastering such a question immediately has applications in nanofabrication, but also in self-organization of, of materials and also in how potentially we make new materials, right? Whether we could grow them or whether we fabricate them uh, in a traditional way. Uh, before I conclude, it has also not escaped our notice, and I'm sure yours also not, that uh, nature hasn't only inspired scientists, but of course also generations of artists and architects. And there's myriad, myriads of examples I could give, uh, just a few to mention. If people don't know it yet, check out the book by Ernst Haeckel from 1904 called Art Forms in Nature, or in German, uh, Kunstform der Natur, 
that is now part of the public domain. Uh, Anthony Gaudi uh, from Barcelona with La Sagrada Familia comes into mind, or more recently, uh, Dutch designers such as Joris Larman with the Bone Chair or uh, Don Rosenharde uh, with projects such as Glowing Nature, Lotus Dome or Intimacy. I'd be happy to talk a bit more about these projects as well in the discussion. Also with the advent of molecular biology in the 20th and 21st century, just think of the capabilities you now have with gene editing. Uh, these powerful tools and also the fascination of what we can do on, or possibly also the danger what one could do with bad intention uh, naturally causes or, or triggers a response from, from the humanities and also from, from artists. And so I think this engagement, not only uh, with scientists, but also with, with other parts of society is in, incredibly important for bio-inspiration. And potentially also as, as, as just as a citizen is important to reflect deeper on our relationship with nature and what understanding biological systems around us means for our self-understanding, but also how we are born, grow, live, age and die. To conclude, uh, I would also like to end on a personal note, as Tom did on a daily basis. Tom and I work together uh, by chance. He's actually also an organic chemist, but now more of a material scientist. Uh, in our team, we have people from all, all walks of life, uh, from physics, from material science, from engineering, from uh, uh, what have you, from math, from pure theory. And so it's an absolute pleasure to work with a very interdisciplinary team in this interdisciplinary field. It's sometimes also a bit of a challenge, not because of the people, but because of the language we speak. So we have to learn each other's language and be patient. And I sometimes have no clue what other people are saying. And I'm sure that's the other way around as well. And so it's incredibly rewarding to, to dig in and, and put the effort to actually understand each other and create something new. Uh, with that, I'm happy to start a discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was lovely. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Um, I think, yeah, that was uh, quite inspiring already. I just um, posted the first question uh, that, you know, I, I'm hoping that we can all discuss as a group uh, here in the chat. Um, and it's, you know, please, please just ping in the group and then I'll meet you to this. It's basically what examples of bioinspiration or biomimicry are you already familiar with? Um, perhaps a few that uh, have not been uh, named already by the speakers, but you know, I, I want to give you like, uh, you know, a quick sec to just think about this. I would love to hear from all of you, you know, who are here on this call. So please uh, let me know uh, if, if you'd like to contribute. But perhaps, uh, uh, Michael, you just want to uh, expand a little bit uh, on the ones that you just mentioned, uh, where you said you'd be happy to talk a little bit more and go into more detail. Um, and then uh, perhaps we can take David uh, McMahon as, uh, as the first participant uh, contribution. Well, sure. Uh, which one? More the art one or more the scientific ones? Uh, well, I think I would love to hear from the art one just because we heard mm -hmm. from the scientific ones a little bit before, but uh, we, we definitely, yeah, whichever you find more inspiring, honestly. I mean, I'm sure we get to the science part, so I'm, I'm happy to also talk a bit about the art part. Uh, particularly about the two Dutch designers, I can actually quickly put them into the chat as well, so that would be uh, Joris Larman uh, with the bone chair, uh, and then uh, Don Rosegarde uh, with projects as, one second, sorry. <laughs> uh, there will be Intimacy, uh, Lotus Stone, and the last one was the, anyways. Yeah, so, so uh, the bone, yeah. The, the bone chair is very neat because if you look at how nature builds stuff, uh, right? So think about you were in the industrial revolution, uh, you wanted to build a steam train. You had a design sketch and you knew what kind of materials you would take and you will, you will carefully think about how to build your train or your engine and then build it and make sure that everything is up to specification. This is very different in nature. Take for example, a bone that uh, doesn't have a design sketch. There's no like blueprint there. You can go back to the blueprint and say, okay, my bone has succeeded because it's exactly as specified. But uh, actually what happens 
Now, obviously, the only tool that nature has is namely to build up from, a sing from single cells. And so it's more of kind of an iterative program that is saved in the DNA and that allows it then to build it up over time, which means you have more flexibility. And so what bones do, both at the large scale, but also at the smaller scales, is to enforce their structures where there is a lot of load and to take away material where there is little load. And so basically what uh, Jori Slarman has done uh, in this chair project is do the same. They had a, had a uh, I think it was a collaboration with Opal, where they had a pro computer program that depending on the load, uh, they could actually take away material where it was needed and actually build or reinforce the material where it was needed. And in this way, uh, they built the chair. And actually now they have, I think, certain other type of furnitures that are built on the same type. Of, of principle. Lovely, yeah, this is great. I think uh, I'm already seeing a few uh, other contributions popping in in the chat. I also checked out the other ones and they look totally fantastical. So I encourage all of you to uh, just type them in on Google really quickly to get, uh, to get an understanding. Those things are definitely better seen. But, um, you know, David uh, McMahon, I'm hoping that you don't mind me unmuting you if you want to share the one that you just um, posted in the chat, that would be amazing. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I, I did want to share um, uh, my screen um, so I could talk about these images a little bit. Um, I, I haven't translated them to a, a product or a material, but uh, I did want to show people um, that they're available. And, uh, and I can, uh, can say that they're certainly inspiring for me you know, regarding this bone chair, for example. Uh, I started working on, on, on bugs, and um, are you able to see my screen now? No, I need to make you a co-host, uh, which I'm doing as we speak. So now you should be able to. So uh, uh, these are some images that we made uh, using a, a CT uh, scanning technique. Can you guys see his screen? No? Are you able to see those? No. Uh, I think you may need to share a different screen. Not yet, sorry. If Not anyone yet. else wants to share something and actually show it to us, then yes, now it works. Then get ah, your Great, okay. So all of these are CT scans. They're micro CT scans uh, uh, done with the uh, uh, Zeiss X-Radia um, uh, uh, CT scanner. It's a micro CT scanner. So the, basically they're translating the X-ray data to a, vis a visible wavelength and then they can magnify them. Anyway, when I uh, first started doing this, you know, looking at bugs, uh, I'm a, a civil engineer, and I was fascinated by, by the, the, these little structures. Uh, you know, as a civil engineer at a, a joint, for example, the, the main problem is shear strength, and so you want density. And then out in the middle of uh, a, a length like this, uh, it's making space for the muscle, but also it's maximizing its uh, moment of inertia. And so uh, I think it's very cool. Uh, as I look at these bugs, I uh, um, see all sorts of things. And I, I just uh, hope other people are as inspired by these images. They're difficult to, these are, things are difficult to see with a microscope. And as, say somebody who's a, a bug expert would be able to see them and map them out. But one of the, uh, the nice features of using this method is that you can show the entire thing in, in focus at once. And uh, you can also dissect them. So in this case, we've removed most of the muscle tissue that would be obscuring all these different structures. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was very interesting to me, for example, is how these uh, pieces of the exoskeleton extend. It's in the. Um, this is the rear end of a, of an ant, and it's open now. Normally, this is closed, and you see this arc right here. It matches this arc here. So this whole thing slides into this thing. I was fascinated by that. Uh, it's a wonderful solution to being able to open something and extend it and manipulate it. Uh, so uh, I, I hope these are inspiring to people. This they, is fantastic. 
We are. Yes. This is wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, something to, to add on in terms of, uh, you know, if, if people are interested in looking at very close up pictures of insects, um, the, uh, so it's true that if you go back through the literature about um, insect morphology, uh, you do begin in like the 70s and 80s as electron microscopy sort of began to be widely available in university settings. Sort of an explosion of, of um, sort of structural biology papers on, on um, uh, not only insects, but really any living thing. Uh, that kind of was a... a, a really interesting thing to do at the time because no one had looked that closely at uh, the microstructures of, um, you know, different uh, living organisms before. Um, and so in particular, I'd like to recommend the Journal of Morphology, um, which has been around for a while uh, for uh, images of that type. That's uh, where you'll find a lot of really good sort of ultra structure um, imagery. And this is, this is fantastic though. This is, uh, um, looks, particularly, I don't know, high resolution and uh, everything's in focus at once. This is great. Yeah. I mean, so that's a, that's the magic of having it as a, you know, as 3D data rather than an image that's collected at a particular focal length. Uh, we can then use a virtual camera and adjust the focal length to whatever, whatever our model is. This is, a, by the way, is the, the, the sexual organ. This was a male ant. And we were working with uh, Zeiss and the California Academy of Sciences, uh, Dr. Fisher there. And he was interested in using these structures to classify the ants. So that's why we have this isolation of this. Basically, this big triangular thing here, that's, that's an ant penis. Normally, it's, it's, act, it's folded up inside this thing called a vulcella. And so this is kind of 180. It's, it's opened up right now. And this end is acting like a cam against the exoskeleton. And then this uh, up here is the testes. Anyway, it was uh, amazing to me because I knew nothing about ants. As soon as I saw these images, and I think I've, I've had this experience showing many other people, if you can show them something, if they can visualize it, they get very excited about, you know, uh, doing something with it, that suddenly the ideas start popping and stuff. So, um. I have an interesting question, if that's okay here. Uh, as a, as a civil engineer, as a structural engineer, like I think the structure is fantastic, but like, wouldn't you also need to be looking at how it moves? You know, like how the legs, for example, extend, and how do you deal with that? Or is it enough to just look at the at the form and then deduce? Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's fascinating. All, all of that stuff is fascinating to me. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's far outside of my field. Uh, okay. you, you know, for me to be able to identify these parts, you know, it's like I, 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 the process was I saw something interesting. We, uh, we, we pointed out to Dr. Fisher and he says, oh, yeah, we know all about that. We, one of the things, for, for example, was uh, we had this one very bright spot in the scan. And we thought at first it was a, maybe a grain of sand or we finally decided it was a piece of metal. And we saw, uh, pointed it out to Dr. Fisher, we, we think this thing is somehow uh, got this metal inside of it. It's using uh, metal. He says, oh, yeah, ants sequester metal. Uh, and then, you know, the question is, well, what are they doing with it? And so then the theories start, you know, uh, of I don't think Brian uh, uh, knew uh, for us or for me, I think it's, uh, it's actually part of an electrical system. That is that they're using static electricity to be able to walk on things, to walk up glass, for example, ants are one of the bugs that can walk up glass. Not all bugs can do that. But I think they're using this. It's uh, tied into their neuro system. They're able to control their charge. That's just a theory throwing it out there for anybody who might do something with that. Wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, if we have another one, I think uh, David uh, Grosser, if you also mentioned one in the chat. And if, you, if anyone else wants to share, just please let me know, and then I'll, I'll allow you to screen share. David Grosser. Hi. So um, first, uh, before we go on, I'll just say that the study of mechanical design of insect genitalia is amazing because uh, <laughs> they can't check each other out visually and identify the, the pieces have to fit together. Oh, and man. so it's really important for 
uh, a beetle to, to expend the energy and effort to mate with the proper other beetle of the same species to get viable offspring. So you have species with right and left hand corkscrew uh, genitals to fit appropriately. It's, it's, it's a very interesting, fun area and important for the study of sexual selection and Darwinian theory. Now, the reason Allison picked me, though, wasn't to tell anecdotes about biological design and genitals. Um, it's about uh, the fact that I spent uh, my, the pr really productive parts of my adult life researching primary visual cortex, wiretapping on the, um, what are called the receptive field properties of neurons in the primary visual cortex of various higher mammals with very good uh, visual systems, primates and other higher mammals. And the interesting thing is that uh, the architecture, when examined through the tools of linear systems analysis with a few nonlinearities, detected, measured, and thought through and modeled, um, is basically the template for convolutional neural networks as the revolutionary 2012 and on um, uh, design for deep learning. Uh, so you have stages of pooling information with linear weights, then some kind of rectification nonlinearity, a little kind of logistic thing, a little game control pooling, and then push it on to the next uh, layer. Um, and obviously how you do the linear weights is very important, but that that's how the visual system looks in a lot of mammals, uh, many synapses in. So within the retina, into the so-called relay nucleus of the lateral geniculate, and then in the most bizarre, specialized, and enormously different piece of neocortex that is the primary visual cortex in mammals. It has a special name because it has so many extra cells that it looks different. Um, but even in non-primates, that same design is the template for, uh, and I could go on and on about how cool this area is, because it brings all this information from the two eyes. It's actually about 50% of all the input to the central nervous system of the human is from the two eyes, the 2.2 million retinal ganglions. I could go on and on about how incredibly important vision is and be a vision chauvinist. But the point is that, um, really due to DARPA funding in the 70s, it started to attract really, really, really smart people plus me. And uh, by the time I got there, a lot of really interesting things had been figured out quantitatively, and it's a really interesting area for the application of maps to uh, signal flow and information in, in, in biological systems. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you, Tom or Michael. Do you have a comment or something? Yes, actually a question maybe for you. Um, right, so, so were people, and uh, also p particularly you, I guess, uh, did you know what you were looking for? Like, so, there, so there's this quote um, from a Dutch guy that said like, if bone is the solution, what is the problem? Right, uh, so, so I mean, oh, I, I, studying I, 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 biology, I, sorry. Yeah. So, so, so we have two eyes and they change the separation while you're growing. Um, the eye length is changing. So you know you're studying a system that has recalibration that has to be very, very precise. The eye movements themselves are incredibly precise. So you have these problems. And then you have the visually guided behavior sets a number of constraints and problems. And again, here I could go on and on. But one issue is just raw sensitivity. Uh, in the late 40s, it was established that under suitably dark adapted conditions, presenting the stimulus just so, there is evidence for quantal detection. So when you have a high fidelity system of a trained subject that can actually detect a single quantum absorption in a rod in the eye and have all that information preserved until you get to a finger press of a button, that's just crazy, okay? That's, so you know you're studying something very precise. My own work, was about studying the integration of motion information. How do you extract um, uh, the direction of motion of edges? And once you do, if you have motion transparency, multiple at the same depth plane, 
multiple edges moving in different directions, what do you do with that? Okay, sometimes if it's, uh, let's see, yeah, if it's a checkerboard, this finger appears locally to be going that way, this finger seems to be going that way. If you're moving up, how do you integrate that into a single pattern motion? Or sometimes you just get motions sliding over each other. And that's very important for animals that fish are looking through the surface of water um, uh, and where depth isn't really a very useful cue all by itself. You have to sort out different motion flows and how many can you sort out. So we, we knew what we were looking for because we had behavioral constraints to uh, think through the receptive field properties. And there was also some analysis of computational sufficiency um, and issues like aliasing, which is too confusing and technical for, for me to go through without diagrams. But for those engineers who've dealt with aliasing, aliasing is a very serious problem in the processing of information at multiple scales. And it had already been established in my laboratory, my doctoral lab, that um, one octave bands of spatial frequency were very important. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. I'm uh, encouraging everyone here to share uh, additional examples. And David, and maybe a few links as well, uh, if you don't mind, that would be fantastical. Um, I think we have, um, you know, in the interest of time, because the questions that uh, were submitted by, uh, by Michael and Tom are just really extraordinary. So um, let's, let's try to see whether we can cover perhaps like a few more just off the cuff. And also, if you guys have questions uh, to Michael and Tom about their talks, then please preface them with a cue in the chat and either we tackle them in the chat or, or, or I'll mute you to ask, to ask them here. But, you know, one of the questions that I really popped out to me is just because of writing this report lately um, was the question, how should we approach the dichotomy between using nature as inspiration, but at the same time also using man-made engineering to change biological systems, like synthetic biology and um, environmental engineering and so on. And perhaps, uh, Michael or Tom, you would like to kick us off with, a, with, an, uh, with an answer. And if anyone else would like to contribute, just say so in the chat and I'll meet you. I mean, at some point there's a question of feedback, right? Like the, um, uh, so, you know, as, as, human, yeah. as human engineers making things, we can be inspired by, um, by nature. Uh, but, you know, um, we are currently living through, uh, you know, significant climate change, a sixth extinction wave uh, due to habitat destruction. Um, so, you know, it is becoming clear that our, our actions do impact the, uh, the biological world as well. Um, so, uh, I think, um, I think the question is not necessarily a, um, <laughs> a, so there's a question of, uh, knock on effects of what we do already. And then there's a question of how we sort of should remediate them. Um, and I think sort of uh, quote unquote listening to, uh, what nature is doing is, is sort of paramount. But, um, if others want to sort of comment on this uh now's the time michael do you want to have an answer well so I, I don't have a straight answer to do that but i'm just also curious to hear what other people think right like i think so what what i also found interesting about this question is more this like thinking about the underlying kind of perceptions about what we what kind of relationship we have with nature and maybe that drifts up too far but I, but i think it's just interesting like does it actually make sense with our limited capability of human engineering to put it a bit starkly to actually go back into nature and start messing around? Or do we have to do that in order to better understand nature? Uh, so this, this, this kind of questions I find very interesting. Yeah, what's your uh, immediate perception of that? Because it's not like we haven't been doing that all along, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, as a scientist, I daily poke at nature, right, and see what comes back. But uh, the question is of the scale, right? I mean, like if you look at, co at complex systems, there's always a tipping point where if you push too hard, then you break the system or at least change the system in too much uh, in a considerable way that then changes the further trajectory of it. And so I think uh, if we start talking about biotechnology, there's always this question of tipping points, right? And, and of things potentially getting, getting out of hand. So that's something to be cognizant. But in a way, I think poking and doing stuff is the best way of learning, at least in my opinion. 
And uh, do you think, um, you know, that bio inspiration may sometimes be a limiting factor to our creativity too? Like, do you, like, do you ever worry about that in a way or, or to the contrary, have, do you have examples of systems that actually we came up with where we have actually now kind of taken what biology has done via evolution over a long time and we've just kind of sped it up and uh, done it much better, much quicker? You know, is there kind of like a flip side to this as well? A good point. I mean, I, I don't have immediate uh, like uh, examples like on the cuff, but uh, I think I don't necessarily see it as a uh, as like a one way street. I think it's part. It's a possibility of a communication, right? I mean, you can learn from nature, and and what we also like spoke to both Tom and I, but but also David is this idea of right. You have to you have to know what you're looking for, and so by then doing stuff uh, and for example changing nature and seeing what you get as a result you actually may be guided into back uh, to basically refine more what are you looking for if that makes sense and so in a way kind of engaging with nature also uh, enables further by inspiration I'm not sure, Tom. Um, okay so in terms of the question of um, sort of speeding up uh, what the natural selection process does. I mean, so the biotechnology and sort of bioengineering, right, um, where you perhaps have engineered certain um, microorganisms to produce a particular product and then you select for the ones that do that really well um, is an example of sort of how we're sort of a able to speed up um, uh, the achievement by those organisms of a particular end, which is, you know, making some desired chemical product usually. Um, it is not, you know, the the end that, um, so in nature, like survival is the end, right? Survival and reproduction. Um, so by by sort of doing that bioengineering, we're imposing a, like a an objective basically on, on that process, um, a selection parameter. Um, but uh, yeah, it's important to realize that, that um, in, uh, in natural like ecosystems, um, the organisms are, organisms are never trying to sort of find a perfectly optimal solution for a thing. They're more um, sort of looking for a way of accomplishing the goal of, you know, being able to adhere to a wall while also being able to survive and, and thrive in other ways, right? It's sort of a, um, a way to satisfy all of the requirements of living in the environment where they're living. Um, uh, as to your earlier question about sort of um, the limitations of bioinspiration as an approach, um, I certainly do not mean to make the claim that all science has been inspired by, by nature in some way or by biology in some way. Um, well, nature, that's a more debatable thing, but not by biology. I mean, so certainly plenty of theoretical physics uh, experiments uh, have been done um, while assuming conditions of a vacuum and, uh, you know, it, um, on certain length scales that are, you know, either below or well above the constraints of biology. Um, so uh, there, there certainly are many people who think beyond those constraints, but um, for at least a large subset of problems, you know, that we biological systems that operate in a certain temperature ra range with air in the environment, you know, um, uh, face, then biology is a pretty good place to turn. Thank you so much. Yes, it just reminded me a lot on um, maybe some people here in the chat have read that when Slates are colleagues were still online, but uh, the studies on Slack, uh, they're just really quite fantastic. And I think they uh, recently did like a kind of like, we uh, kind of like um, put, put that out again from the archives. And I'm, I found a link here. I'm hoping that you can make it through to the actual post, uh, which is basically on kind of like that idea of Slack and, and evolution that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, that you, you have, it's not, like the most straightforward way uh, to a thing, um, right, to, to, to get a result, but it's kind of like meandering around and uh, through Slack though, um, uh, you have kind of like those systems that are uh, inc incredibly kind of like resilient and unless you kind of like kill off the whole population, there is a way in which, uh, you know, kind of like nature can always go back. Like I was, in, uh, without wanting to get too much into the kind of philosoph philosophy nitty gritty, but like, you know, I think in economic theory, uh, you have this kind of concept of reflexivity a little bit by which, um, you know, it's not only that, you know, our kind of like preferences and kind of like, you know, shape, uh, you know, uh, shape the market, but then, then again, you know, like the market also shapes our preferences. And I think you kind of like see that uh, a lot in, in the way that like algorithms are kind of like uh, predicting 
um, are, are trying to kind of like make our and make our uh, actions a little bit more simpler to be able to better predict it. So I was wondering, um, you know, whether that uh, at all applies, I think, to kind of like the work that you do in a way where, you know, we often talk about positive uh, feedback loops and, and, and inspiration and, and how we can learn from nature. But do you think that there is something going on by which, you know, we're creating uh, feedback loops that uh, may actually kind of like halt or limit our creativity somewhat or get a little bit, uh, you know, kind of like... Um, uh, get kind of too simple or, or yeah, are in some kind of negative feedback loop. I don't know. I'm just throwing that, that question out there. Maybe it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, intuit intuitively, I agree. I think that is, that is definitely a problem, right? And I think that's exactly what uh, one has to do when one studies these this biological systems. Also, uh, once in a while, take a step back and, and really reflect on what do I actually want to achieve, uh, what 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 kind of boundary condition is the organism operating in? How do these boundary conditions actually align with my project uh, boundary conditions? And I think that's certainly something that one has to be cognizant of. Yeah. I mean, as a as a working scientist, I guess like um, what what you're describing sounds to me like how I feel sometimes when I'm a little too settled in a routine, right? And then like, I, I don't know, go on vacation, take a trip, kind of shake myself out of it a little bit. And then um, I'm able to see some new things uh, or maybe talk to a collaborator who I haven't, you know, heard from in a while, see what they're working on. Um, and, you know, they'll get me thinking in a way I wasn't previously. Um, uh, I'd like to echo what Miki said earlier about um, collaboration and interdis interdisciplinarity. Um, just getting regular exposure to new stuff is always great when when you're um, working on a hard problem, right? Like, it, it, the more inputs that can give you ideas, the better. Um, in in many ways, I think also adding to what Tom said is the like so far, at least I'm not aware of like by inspiration is not often used for like detrimental effects, you know, like it like may per, like, so for example, biased al algorithms are, can be a problem, right? And and if they are based uh, on, on, for example, a, a, a neurological system, I, I don't know enough about that, how that could like influence the bias. But my, my hunch would be that that is kind of biases and the problems are caused by the scientists and not by the, by the natural solution that has inspired it. But that's just a hunch. Okay, awesome, lovely. Um, I think, I mean, we're now a little after the, uh, the past uh, 12.05 mark. I think, you know, one question that, uh, that really stuck out with me in case, you know, you're, you're uh, interested to stay on longer and then we can maybe uh, move to uh, kind of participant comments more. But, you know, one question I think that, uh, that, that was from the list that I really, really loved is, you know, the, the question of like, what do we actually need from our materials, right? Um, what do they need to be able to do um, and how much uh, smartness uh, is useful in this? And um, I think, you know, one thing that, um, th another question that ties into this, uh, which I would love to get your guys' opinion on as well is, you know, what are kind of like unsolved problems uh, in a given field. So, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, what, why, what kind of materials do we need? Why do we need them? Uh, what kind of properties would be useful? Uh, and then why can't we push, push the envelope further? And uh, could nature be kind of an inspiration there? Um, maybe uh, if you wanted to kind of like go ahead and, uh, and say something like, what, what is an ideal material that you'd really, really love to see? What's an ideal property that you could make up? Or in, even, even if it's not just increased efficiency, but what, is, what are perhaps some new properties that uh, you'd love materials to have? And then um, perhaps someone uh, can think about a way in which biology has already done that. I can go first. I mean, something... I mean, there's, there's myriads of problems. A very fundamental problem that I'm personally very interested in and many others as well is really this idea of can we actually generate artificial life? Not, uh, not in the idea of actually creating a life form. Potentially people also want to do that, but, but more in the, in the regard of like, can we actually make materials that grow, that develop, that like change, that learn? And I think that's very much at the forefront at the moment and will be for the next 50, 100, 200 years because it's just a very fundamental and very, very difficult problem. Uh, something that, that is also quite interesting, I think, and worth mentioning here is uh, sustainability, right? Uh, as material scientists, we're always also at least in part responsible for what we put out there and how that is in, impacting the world. 
And if you look at how nature handles, for example, aging of materials uh, and also how we age, I mean, stuff is constantly replaced, you know, like proteins have a certain lifetime and then they degrade and then they're replaced. And so uh, part of the Eisenberg group is sometimes thinking along these white lines, other groups certainly as well, is this idea of like, how do we replenish materials? How do we restore function in materials so that we don't have to throw away our phone after a year or that we don't have to uh, have a bridge that, that breaks down after 75 years? What like what does it need that we can actually that it can self heal? And I saw actually some questions and comments to that also in the chat. And what kind of concepts can we come up with that that either automatically replace the material on the go, well, in to prevent aging or or stuff like that. Yeah, I, when you mentioned uh, uh, a life, I just posted the from Timothy Boospus. I don't know if, uh, if you guys know that one uh, on the C elegance, uh, which. Uh, is like a kind of like new robotics project uh, in which they're actually trying to kind of like um, have uh, have a robot and like uh, run with a C, C elegance kind of like let's say a software framework uh, it's, it's, oh, cool. it's, it was really cool and quite interesting when it came out a while ago um, uh, David do you want to uh, David McMahon you just commented on wood do you want to uh, I'll unmute you if you don't mind uh, let's see can you hear me now yeah yeah yeah, I've, I've always, uh, well, since I uh, took a class in, in college, you know, as a civil engineer um, on wood design, uh, wood has certain uh, wonderful properties. Um, we use it, you know, in structural engineering, but wouldn't it be great if we could grow, uh, grow those very efficient shapes that the ants are doing rather than just have square and rectangular pieces of wood that maybe we build in into more complex elements they could be tremendously efficient and uh, so I, I hope somebody is working on that kind of thing I, I did want to echo the thing about the uh, uh, sort of self-replicating systems I've been following a company called uh, lineage cell therapeutics they're growing um, uh, using stem cells as uh, as uh, therapeutics. And so one of the things they're working on is, and they have gotten into human trials on is in the, in the eye. I thought whoever was working on eyes would be interested in that. Um, uh, and the amazing thing is it works. You know, if you get the right cells into the right place, they just seem to know what to do. And uh, so I think that's part of it is understanding. I mean, right now they're, they're basically, I don't think they really understand. They're just trying it out, see if it does work, it works. But I think it'd be very interesting to figure out how does that work? How do those cells know how to get themselves into the right place and work with all the other cells that are around them? I think that's amazing. And so I hope somebody's working on that. What was the name of that company again? Sorry, I didn't catch that the first time. Lineage Cell Therapeutics. Thanks. LCTX is the, the stock ticker. But uh, um, yeah, they've gotten pretty far in the eyes and also on spinal cord injuries uh, where they're uh, growing. I think it's the, the sheath that grows around neurons. So if you've had a spinal cord injury and they're, they're finding that uh, these treatments actually work. You just have to get the right cells into the right place. And so I, 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 for a while, you know, with our work, I thought, oh, well, people would be interested in scanning things of interest. You know, say you wanted to grow a kidney. Well, we could scan a kidney, you know, as long as it fits in the machine or you have some mode of, of collecting the data, uh, we ought to be able to replicate them. But apparently you don't need to work that hard you just need to get the kidney cells and get them into the right place. And so understand if you're trying to manipulate that so that you can control what grows, you've got to understand how those cells interact in some way. I, I, I would love to learn more about that if somebody knows something about that. Lovely, please uh, contact him, uh, contact David in the chat in case you do. Uh, we have a question from Mark Stove to the panelists and Mark, I'm unmuting you now. Okay, this is great. Thank you. Um, so I'm aware of more cases where 
we discover things in nature after the fact. So the latest hot area leads to people discovering that, oh yeah, there are some organisms out there that are already doing these things. So in, for example, there are the silver ants that uh, live in the Sahara and can walk around in, the, in full sunlight uh, on the sand and be five degrees C cooler than uh, the, the ground temperature because they're radiating. Uh, they, they have a metamaterial set of hairs that are radiating uh, infrared light into the uh, atmospheric window. So this is great and it, it mimics what people are now trying to do to, to do radiative cooling uh, for buildings and lots of things. So, but I'm wondering, how do, you, how do you, the question to the panelists is, how can we be inspired by nature, go out and find things that we don't understand, and then use that to discover the physics, and just to sort of maybe try to reverse the, the balance as I see it. Um, and I, so, for example, one of the things I would do is if we, if people know Geordie LaForge character in Star Trek The Next Generation, with his visors that, that supposedly look at every, uh, you know, uh, wavelength, you could imagine something where you walk through rainforests, uh, probably at night, because there are more interesting things you could do, and you, you look for some po impossible combinations of polarization and, and frequencies and, uh, you know, fast fluorescence, and uh, basically try to find things that are out there in the forest that are they're doing things that have never been seen before and then figure out how they're doing it. That's how I would do it because that's sort of closer to my, my own research. But have you all thought of how you would look to nature for impossible things and then find how there are things out there that nature has discovered first and we can benefit from? The short answer to this is to fund biologists, honestly. Like the- Great. I, I think we as a society are like pretty bad at recognizing the value of basic- Field biologists. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, field biologists. High tech field biologists. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, like, as as someone who is not in that field, reading those papers in a somewhat disciplined way um, is is kind of the closest that I can conveniently get in my life. But um, yeah, uh, you know, doing fairly regular literature searches for weird animals and plants and whatever, you know, um, is uh, a pretty good way of of getting exposure to things that I did not know were possible before. <laughs> In addition to what Tom says, uh, I think you also have to build, uh, first of all, open science so that journal articles are accessible to people. Uh, databases where you actually collect these insights in a meaningful way. So it's accessible to people. And uh, a potential third, this is just something that I'm coming up, coming up on the cuff with, is uh, use of citizen science. I mean, people love going out in nature. They have a completely different view often than on, on nature than what we have as scientists. I'm sure we could do some cool stuff with that as well. Thank you, and uh, it's lovely. Uh, I think one a book that came to mind uh, that may be relevant to that is The Over Story. Do you guys know that? Um, recently, yeah. I'll, I'll put, uh, yes, Thomas? Richard Powers, the um, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I'll post it here in the chat, but it's very much uh, you know of like okay, well, let's let's find and go out in nature and and and, and find inspiration there, and um, definitely okay. I'll I'll just post it in the chat here for those who want to check it out. Let's take um, and also um, Michael and Thomas. I don't know if uh, if it because we're now over time. We're now uh, exactly fifty minutes over time. Do you have time for one more question, or do you have to hop off? I've got time for one more. Yeah. Okay, great. Then, Miles, uh, I'll uh, unmute you now. Um, all right. Hey, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I was just curious uh, if there's any work in the sort of bioengineering field on different types of energy capture. So, for example, you know, we've got technology, the, your basic solar panel that converts photons into electrons, um, and you've got slightly more sophisticated biological systems like the fungus down in Chernobyl that, you know, uses Compton scattering instead of the photoelectric effect. Uh, are there any other types like that? Um, uh, seems like our power system today still relies on just generating massive amounts of heat to spin some magnets. And it seems like biology should have some better insights for 
improvements. I was just curious if there's anything going on. So I, um, I, I just dropped a review in the chat um, on so-called blue energy, um, which is uh, basically the idea that whenever um, fresh water flows into the ocean, uh, the enthalpy of mixing between uh, a really sort of salty reservoir and a not so salty reservoir uh, is actually quite high. It's the um, equivalent, basically the, in the thermal energy, um, the equivalent of water falling 230 or so meters um, is, is released just as waste heat whenever a river flows into the ocean. Um, so there's been an amount of uh, research in the past couple decades um, on how do you capture that energy. Usually uh, this involves selective membranes um, and basically either capturing it as um, sort of osmotic pressure type energy um, or, uh, or electrically using, using charged selective membranes. Um, but uh, th that's one example of sort of an unexploited um, energy or chemical potential gradient, I guess, from which usable energy can be extracted in, in nature. Um, and I mean, there are certainly others, right? Like, uh, the, um, is the one that I, the one that I posted has sort of bearing on my own, on my own work, but you can imagine, um, I mean, if you imagine that, uh, between any sort of two compartments of differing, um, chemical composition, so you have a concentration gradient, right? Um, in whenever you have a concentration gradient, um, you potentially have extractable energy. Um, and so imagining places in biology, um, or, or like in the environment or in biology, uh, where concentration gradients exist is um, uh, sort of a, an interesting uh, way of thinking of sort of places where you might be able to park a membrane uh, that is able to then extract um, energy. So within living bodies is a sort of favorite example of mine. Um, so uh, we know that um, our, uh, it's acidic within our stomach, right? Um, and it's not acidic basically everywhere else <laughs> in, in our bodies. Um, we have sort of a fairly neutral physiological pH. Um, so right there, there's an orders of magnitude um, uh, concentration gradient in two in, homeostatically maintained in two different parts of a living body. Um, so potentially that's extractable uh, for things like implantable devices. Um, uh, there's yeah. Anytime, uh, anytime you have gradients in nature, that's an opportunity. That's really cool. Thank you. No problem. Lovely. Okay. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to add to that, but I would love for you to perhaps like, uh, you know, to uh, kind of close it out any, um, as you know, any final words, if you have something that you really love participants, uh, you know, to follow up on after this, if there's like, you know, um, a particularly inspiring example that you have. And if not, then uh, maybe you want to tackle the question of uh, the one that we had on bio inspiration and, and art. Um, so basically uh, the question that you suggested is, does bioinspiration lead to solutions in engineering that are inherently simple but elegant? How does beauty fit into this? Why are organic shapes and biological design principles so appealing to artists and to us? And to me, the first thing that always comes to mind is the David Deutsch talk on why are flowers beautiful uh, for that? And I'll post it here and uh, maybe with a link, but uh, perhaps this is one way uh, and we could, we could end this unless you have something else uh, that you'd like to share with participants. Michael. I can start exactly. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for the discussion. It was fantastic. Uh, I would like to end on the note that, and I think that has come up several times in our discussion, uh, this idea that it really matters how you frame your problem and that you know what you're looking for. And if you don't know what you're looking for, that at least you have some kind of strategic approach on how to, how to look into nature and be at least sufficiently open uh, for, for new type of problems. But I think that's, that's, at least in my personal opinion, one of the fundamental problems of, not problems, but like caveats of, of bio-inspiration. Uh, yeah, with regard to beauty, I mean, why are mathematicians drawn to certain equations? There's, some, there's apparently something that is inherent in, in our nature that, that draws us to these kind of questions. Uh, I certainly 
think there's beauty in, in, in chemical systems, in, in how reactions proceed and, and in how you get sorting or the advent of chirality in, special, in, in certain circumstances that we don't understand or only little understand, but that's just in a way pure. Why do I feel that? I don't know. Tom, any additions? I don't know that I have a lot to add, honestly. I <laughs> All right, great. Well, I posted another link to Kat, um, Kevin Simler's A Natural History of Beauty in there. Uh, I really, really uh, like that a lot. Um, thank you so much um, for joining. I think we really covered a, a treasure trove of like starting on a quite scientific footing and then, you know, going all the way into, uh, you know, I think like to me, very inspirational um, questions. I think that, you know, really remind us uh, of kind of like the, like what beauty it is to be alive and that we should kind of like wander around with our eyes a little bit more open, even though we should first define the problem before we look into nature. <laughs> Sometimes we can just enjoy it too. So thank you so much. I really like that. That was fantastic. I, I'm, I really also thank everyone for sharing so, so many links in the chat. Um, I'm hoping maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be able to transfer a few of those in the follow-up. And uh, Michael and Thomas, uh, thank you so much for making time for this. It was really, uh, really quite inspirational. And if you, uh, if you uh, have any kind of like follow-up links to share, then I would, could send them out in a follow-up email to participants. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping that this wasn't the last time that we talked about this topic. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm hoping that uh, I will get to speak uh, again very soon. Thanks a lot.